So we're starting off our uh, our afternoon here. Uh, my name is Brian Lance. Of course, with the Killer Institute, and um, picking up on uh, uh, a uh, an important uh, set of conceptions and, uh, and the uh, role of a, a very important individual uh, that Helga discussed. Um, I'm going to be discussing uh, uh, Nicholas Kuz, uh, and but specifically uh, his role in uh, in the, the development of uh, Renaissance painting, and we'll do it in a very compressed way. So this is not your uh, art appreciation class or uh, or something of that sort. Uh, uh, we're going to try to compress a lot into uh, uh, in a few words. So, um, I mean, first of all, um, when we think of, uh, of paintings, um, um, uh, we obviously are thinking of sight, and, uh, and we're thinking of light. And light is going to be a subject we'll come back to in different ways, <coughs> including Einstein's uh, uh, conceptions of light uh, and relativity, uh, relative to light, and so forth. Uh, so this, will, I guess, will be a theme throughout the day, you could say. But the first thing I want to emphasize is that sight, your sight, seeing, is willful. That you're not a camera. And these days, with, uh, with the cameras that we have on our cell phones and so forth, you know how badly you can take pictures, how badly they come out. It's, it's not seeing what you see. Uh, and then that is just another kind of uh, way of thinking about this. Uh, but sight is very willful. And it's also uh, a, a least action process. Uh, least action in the, in the sense of the greatest amount of work done for the least amount of energy expended, if you will. What I mean by that is if you think about sight, your sight, what sight involves is you're looking not at things, uh, unless you're, you know, have an obsessive personality, but a, a normal healthy person or child isn't really looking at things, or increasingly the child grows out of looking at things. Um, you're, looking, you're looking for transformation. You're looking for change or potential change something coming into your sight that suddenly grabs your attention. What is this? What does this mean? What could, what are the implications of this? Um, the importance here is the idea of a least action principle being at work, um, pre-consciously, um, but also it's something in terms of how you are designed, how uh, the mind and the eye, which really grows up, you know, in terms of the, the growth of the uh, of the child in the womb, it's, it's really one uh, organ that develops into a differentiated brain and, and eye, but it starts as essentially a single uh, process. Um, uh, that your eyes and the utilization of your eyes is from the standpoint of a coherency, and we'll come back to this in the course of this short discussion, of your, your mind and your capabilities of sight related to your mind, the useful utilization of your mind, with the universe. That is, that the universe itself is fundamentally a process of continual transformation. And you're, you are designed as a human being, not as an animal, but as a human being, to, to look for those transformations and participate in that process of transformation. Um, so, when you say, for example, think about it in a different way, uh, I see. When you, you're explaining something and the person says to you, I see, they, uh, the inference is uh, that you're making something intelligible to them. Right? There's something, intelligibility is involved in this question of sight. Again, it's not a snapshot. It's I see. It's intelligible. So what is it that you're trying to make an intelligible? Uh, the idea of art often is that uh, well, art should imitate nature. That's the Aristotle. That's Aristotle. I think mean, he stated that art should imitate nature. You know, in other words, it should be a camera. 
in a certain sense. That's what art should be. And some people will utilize that argument as against what they see is the crumbing art uh, of modern art or throwing whatever on a canvas and, and similar sorts of things and say, yeah, but, but I want my art, you know, to, to, to reflect nature or, 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 or be a replication of things that I see. But that's not what art is about or what art became. I would like say that's never what art was about. Um, 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 to, to, um, to build something in three dimensions, we can, we can frame it, you know, you can draw a cube on a, a, a diagram of a cube in three dimensions on a, a, a board, a chalkboard or a whiteboard or whatever. But again, that's not painting. And, and I'm bringing that up because we'll, we'll deal very briefly with linear perspective. Leonardo was more to the point. He said that, that what art is out to do, Leonardo da Vinci, his art is out to depict something beyond sight, that that's the actual intention of, of paintings, of art generally. Poetry, music, is to present something beyond sight itself. So this takes us to another uh, dimension. Um, uh, let's start with, a, 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 with Cusa just very briefly. Uh, one of Cusa's writings is uh, the Nicholas of Cus that, uh, that Helga was uh, referring to her in her remarks. There is the Docta Ignorantia, which she mentioned. And since shortly after that, uh, he wrote The Vision of God. And, uh, um, and here's how he introduces this. This is not a this is not catechism, this is not a religious presentation. Uh, I, I won't think about it in, in terms of the, in the context in which I've uh, tried to frame it here. He says, he, he's writing this to a fellow brethren um, um, uh, at a monastery. He says, I will now show you, dearest brethren, as I promised you, an easy path onto mystical theology. And, and by mystical theology, that's uh, that's usually termed an immediate uh, knowledge of God. An immediate knowledge of God. Um, an easy path onto mystical theology. For knowing you to be led by zeal for God, I thank you worthy of the opening up of this treasure as assuredly very precious and most fruitful. And first I pray to the Almighty and so on and so forth. And then he says, if I strive in human fashion to transport you to things divine, I must needs use a comparison of some kind. Now among men's works, I have found no image better suited to our purpose than that of an image which is omnivoyant, its face by the painter's cunning art, being made to appear as though looking on all around it. And uh, he cites the example of Roger van der Weyden, uh, Weyden uh, Roger van den Weyden, um, a friend of his, an associate of his, a renowned artist, uh, not of Italy, but of, uh, of Northern Europe, of Brussels, um, as an example of this. Um, uh, that painting uh, does not survive, as far as I know. Um, what we have here, if you can, Mike, you can put it up on the, yeah. he's going to put it up on the screen, but I'm also asking Mike uh, to show you, this is a small reproduction. Um, and uh, it's behind you. and if you um, if you look at the you might be able to notice here but here but more from Mike um, and you, Mike if you could move kind of into the audience a little bit perhaps if you look at this painting if you're not familiar with it already wherever you are sitting in the room you should notice that 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 the that the uh, that that uh, uh, the eyes of that figure which is Durer, the, the artist Durer, uh, is looking directly at you, Elric Durer, a self-portrait after the image of Christ. Um, so, um, the lights might help just for a little bit. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. So, so Mike is showing, just hold it in one place, Mike. Okay. Is it looking at you? Yeah. Does he look at you? Yeah. From over there. Yeah. 
How about from over here? Does it look at you? And if you move that picture around the room, those eyes will stay on you. Or you. Or you. They stay on all of you at the same time. And uh, Kuza says, he says in, in regards to this, in other words, God is looking at you, each one of you, as if only looking at you, as if only concerned about you. And even if you turn your back on him, he's still looking at you. Right? And wherever you go, he's looking at you. And if your friends move, you all share this, the fact that he is looking at you simultaneously to capture this idea of God's relationship you know, from the infinite uh, into the finite domain of seeing and sight. Um, this is a, an example of the role of art, right, being utilized by Kuzma to the, the very introduction of his famous piece. Um, then because its glance regardeth thee alike in each position and leaveth thee not whithersoever thou goest, a questioning will arise in thee, and thou wilt stir it up, saying, Lord, in this image of thee, I now behold thy providence by a certain experience of sense. Right? Through your senses, you are allowed to grasp something outside the picture, God himself. Um, For if thou leavest not me, who am the vilest of men, never and to none wilt thou be lacking. For thou art present to all, and to each, and so forth. But then he asks the question, he says, But uh, for thou, the absolute being of all, art as entirely present to all as though thou hadst no care for any other. But I don't see you. I still, I'm, I'm seeing, but I'm not seeing. I'm, I'm gaining a sense. <coughs> But how could I come to know you more perfectly? Um, he says, thou art a God hidden, infinite. Now infinity is beyond all comprehension. Um, uh, and it could not exist in reality did it not behold thee. For sight affordeth being, since it is thine essence. That's what I see. But you, infinite, are beyond sight. Well, this is the problem which Leonardo da Vinci was, is referring to. He's later than, than Kuz. But uh, uh, how do we make the infinite actually known? The next slide. And I'll just uh, pass this around. Um, uh, the idea of the horizon. Think of the idea of the horizon. You've all, um, the horizon, if you're on a, uh, uh, a uh, if you're on, in a plane, you see a horizon line. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's not curved. That's an optical illusion. If you actually had a piece of paper and you moved it along the window, you would see that it's actually not curved. It's your eyes that's curved. But uh, uh, like on a ship, or if you're up on a cliff and you're looking out at the, uh, towards the sunset, right, you see a horizon line. Uh, now, what happens when you move? What if you move towards that horizon line? If you're on a boat, for example, or you're a plane headed into uh, the horizon, whatever that horizon may be, morning or evening or whatever. What happens? Things you pass by get bigger. Yes, but the horizon moves. Yeah. Right? It never, it ne you know, it, it keeps you moving with you, right? You the never horizon. reach the horizon. Mm -hmm. The horizon does not participate oh. in the domain of the measure. <clears throat> it's a transfinite, we would say, or a, uh, Contra would say, or the term was later used, uh, a transfinite. It is between, it's a bridge between the finite and infinite. Now, in, in uh, linear perspective, I'm just passing around an example, uh, a, a uh, early Renaissance uh, um, uh, artist's uh, draftsmanship of linear perspective. You see in that drawing, if you look at the floor, uh, floor uh, uh, of that, the, the uh, cobblestone or whatever, you see that the lines going back meet at infinity. You're aware of this idea, right? That the horizon allows us, the horizon between the finite and infinite allows us to comprehend 
uh, the ordered domain of what we see. In other words, with the utilization of linear perspective, the or you, can, you can order in the context of a painting the, the universe of the scene, which is ordered by the infinite, which is captured uh, in the painting itself. The infinite is made, uh, shall we say, sensuous. Now, that's okay, but there's a, there's a, a, a limitation to this to this horizon line concept. Um, um, uh, uh, partly, uh, it could be said that the, as in this draftsman-like production here, that uh, while it achieves a unity of the parts are, are, are unified into a whole, uh, nonetheless, lazy reason confirms, co co confuses that unity with just simple uniformity. So how is it that you can make, enrich this uh, concept? How can you enrich the domain of, of art and painting, in, in this case in particular, to convey more or to, uh, to escape the limitations? Also, uh, in terms of linear perspective, you have to stand at one point, or you have to be positioned at one point to actually see the organization of the entire painting. If you move to the side and so forth and so on, uh, it no longer works. Uh, you can put up the next one. This is the, the one that I'm, this is what I'm passing around the room. This is a, a, a blow up of that uh, picture. Who's that by? Uh, it's on the back. Uh, Lancy. Uh, Lancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so let me read briefly, how am I doing here on time? <laughs> let me ask. About five more minutes or so? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, let me continue here. Let me read from Kuz again. If we, if uh, with thee to see is to conceive, to create, God's sight uh, is, also, uh, is also creation. Um, if you think of the word conceive instead of creation, um, the seeing is conceiving. It's conceiving a concept. Um, uh, if with thee, with thee, to see is to create, and thou seest not other than thyself, but art thyself the object of thyself, for thou seest and art to be seen and art sight, how then dost thou create things other than thyself? For thou would seem to create thyself even as thou seest thyself. But thou dost strengthen me, life of my spirit. For although the wall of absurdity, which is the coincidence of creating with being created, should seem as if it were impossible, and that creating and being created are one. For to admit this would seem to be to affirm that a thing existeth before it existed, since when he created it, it existed, and yet it existed not because it is created. <laughs> yet this is no real difficulty, since with thee, creation and existence are the same, and creating and being created alike are not else than the sharing of thy being among all, that thou mayest be all in all, and that mayest abide free from all. Now this, think of, of what is Kuza getting at here? And, uh, and then we'll move to s examples of this in terms of the, the work that proceeded from Kuza's conceptions, which I can only indicate here, but uh, at least give you a flavor of. He's identifying the contradictions in this process of God creating but creating really himself, creating in the world himself. So, so is he doing, is there anything, how can he both be the creator and, and the created? Um, and, 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 and saying that, that in fact, once he escaped, if he steps back and thinks beyond these contradictions, intuitively, intuitively he can grasp what a, a process conception Think of society as I was starting to say. A, a productive 
society. Think of the Dark Ages. The Renaissance came out of the Dark Ages, of the Black Death. A new conception was needed if it was going to escape not only that Dark Age happening again, but the Middle Ages that preceded the Dark Ages, and so on and so forth. If man was going to prosper, if mankind was going to improve, improve himself, improve society, and his posterity, there had to be new conceptions. What Kuza is identifying here is the process of creation as itself is as the identity. The, the nature of God is, in the, is, is creation itself, as a process. That is, that's, that's not that God is creating things, it is that God is creation itself. And man, in imitation of God, in imitation of Christ, participates, or can participate, must participate, in that process of creation. Uh, and so we had, in the process of, uh, uh, from, from the, say, the late uh, uh, 1300s, the Black Death is approximately 1350 in that period. By the 1370s, 80s, and so forth, you have a series of efforts made in this direction. Uh, the doors of the baptistry in Florence, you're an example of this. The arts of, of casting bronze had been completely lost. And it was discovered that it had been completely lost because uh, suddenly it was being Roman manuscripts being read and then Greek uh, manuscripts, which discussed the casting or uh, these bronze statues. But nobody at the time uh, of, the, of what was the early days of what became the Renaissance knew anything about carrying on large-scale casting with uh, what's called the lost wax system. This was totally unknown. Um, and yet by the time of Leonardo da Vinci, um, 80 years later, there is over 350 casting facilities, foundries and so forth, in Florence alone. Uh, this was, I'm just, this is a, an example of this. Um, um, the next, uh, so what's required is to go beyond linear perspective. To, to meet the requirements uh, that, uh, that Kuza is talking about. To what? To carry out a process of universal education. Because you had an illiterate population, and it had been for, for, for generations, literally, in the Dark Ages. Right? Besides the psychological holocaust that occurred in the course of the Black Death. So how do you uplift, how do you awaken in the population these conceptions of God and man that would, uh, would make the individual uh, capable of participating in this process of creation without which civilization would, would not uh, exist, certainly not continue to exist. So we have here, this is a painting by Jean Van Eyck, uh, again from uh, the Lowlands, and he was himself a participant in the negotiations between Flanders and Italy and so forth, so he's not somebody outside you know, looking in, he's not somebody uh, painting by numbers or something. Right? <laughs> uh, now, now if, if you look at the front of this painting, uh, if, you, if you have some sense of these ideas already, uh, it, you have linear perspective. If you extended back these panels on the floor, uh, they would ultimately eat a, meet it up at a, at a point on, the, uh, on, the, on, on a horizon line. Right? But this painting is not so simply so. Uh, I hope you can see it here. Uh, this is a, the, a painting of the Chancellor, um, let me, Roland. Um, and of course, this is a, uh, um, this is a, uh, a, a depiction of a, this is a narrative um, uh, scene. Um, the, is referred to the, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but below, you have this level, they're up high, right? which of course is itself really, in a certain sense, unnatural. Um, and below here you see, below them, you see this, the, 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 uh, this, this wall here, below them, and, and, and gentlemen standing there at that wall looking out. And then beyond that, you have this landscape, 
which fades out into what's called aerial perspective. The aerial not being from on high, the aerial being in terms of the air. The change of the color, right, to blue, these uh, shades of blue, gives this sense of depth, right? So you move from linear perspective, you've shifted to another perspective along this wall, you've shifted again, and you shift again. Now, you don't have to understand that. To an individual seeing this painting, the effect would, of this would be profound. Right? You, you, here you have a dialogue of Roland, Chancellor Roland, who played a role that led up to the uh, uh, Council of Florence, um, in, in a dialogue with, with Christ and Mary. Uh, but then beyond that, this, this shifting of perspective again and again and again, drawing you, the viewer, in. Right? Awakening in you a sense of wonder, right? And, and at the same time, it's a wonder that's grasped this, this overarching sense of change and ordered change. So does the horizon from the uh, uh, receiving tiles uh, not the same as the horizon we see way, way back? Right. It's, it's different. Than right. They suddenly lift it up. Yes. Uh, yeah, and and, uh, and of course the elevation of this initial scene, of course, is of course uh, I don't want to say symbolic, but a metaphor itself. That is that this is obviously a, a conversation. First of all, it couldn't occur in real time, in, in terms of normal, practical time, but it occurs a, across time and space. A dialogue between Christ, and so it's elevated, right, as against the rest of the painting. Um, let's go to another painting because we're coming to wrap this up here. Um, uh, Piero della Francesca, he trained Luca Pacioli, who trained Leonardo da Vinci. Much can be said about Cusa's friend, Toscanelli, whose maps were used by Columbus. You're talking about uh, a whole flourishing of ideas, right, which came out of, in particular, Cusa's writings and Cusa's, Cusa's uh, organizing activities. But here, uh, and yeah, could you, people can look at this, uh, as well, maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. I'm not so much drawing your attention to the eyes and whether they follow you or not. I'm, 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 uh, I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, if you're looking at this painting, actually from where you're sitting is approximately right in terms of where the painting was actually located, is you're looking at it straight on here on the foot, on the on the uh, on the. Uh, uh, raised what it, uh, the casket, right? The uh, where Christ had been buried, right? This is the resurrection of Christ, as you can tell, right? You're looking at it straight on, so there's a amb ambiguity of perspective because you're looking at this head on. But at the same time, these figures, by the way in which their heads are tilted and so forth, you're actually to see those figures correctly. You're looking at them upward, okay? But on the other hand, Christ is stepping out of, out of, out of, of an uh, ambiguous perspective to define his own relationship to the field and to the other figures. And beyond Christ, uh, just to point it out, it's, it's blurred here. Could you turn off that light again? Maybe you can see it. On one side, there's life. On the other side, there's death. Right, in terms of, you know, the, the, you can see it in terms of this seasons, but it's not accidental. The point is, this is Christ's resurrection, right? But it's also uh, the resurrection of, of uh, man, of man in the image of God. Right? So th this was, this is a painting in a church, right, which people would have examined and studied and thought about and worshipped as an icon, right? To, as an icon through which you see God as himself and see God in yourself. Right. Um, and finally, just and the, the last, last... And the guy on the right is actually falling out of the picture. Yeah, it's falling out of the picture, yes. <laughs> A little Trump oil there. Um, <laughs> trick of the eye. Um, now this, this was not a progression. This painting is done around 1420 uh, in, in, it's in Florence. Uh, it was done by uh, uh, Masaccio who died at the age of 26. That's why we don't see a lot of his paintings. He was a collaborator of Brunelleschi, who actually, by the way, invented uh, single point linear perspective. Um, but that's another story. But they, this painting, though, is not linear perspective. And it's, it's likely that Brunelleschi advised Masaccio on this painting. 
but again, where you are, the eye of the, uh, the, the person who had watched up, walked up to this work uh, would have been about here, right? Essentially, the dividing between, line between you know, the, this world and the next. Huh? Um, and you have Mary and so forth, and you have these figures. This is the Trinity, right? And you have uh, God uh, uh, reflect uh, or representative lifting Christ up, right? But behind it, you have this. You have a. a, a you can see in the ceiling tiles. You can see an example of linear perspective is organizing a certain space there, right? But that's a different space than organizes the columns, the, the arrangements, and of course Christ kind of comes out. He's in a, a different frame altogether. Right? There's a, you know, you're, 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 if you're honest, when I say honest, I mean in the sense of kind of thinking about the painting as opposed to leaping to, to a, a conclusion. or just kind of, oh, okay, it's a painting of Christ. I'm walking away from it. You see that, that there's, a, there's a deliberate ambiguity created which challenges the viewer to think beyond the painting itself. In a more, in, in, I would say, that goes beyond... Uh, the uh, the first example we saw. This is a profound piece, but this was written in the early 1420s. This is long. This was before the paintings that I've showed you, uh, other ones. Uh, so that so you had from the very beginning this playing with these techniques from the standpoint of the uh, of the reaching the the seer, reaching the the, the person ordinary or otherwise, uh, and awakening in them powers in their own mind, which they not, may have not uh, appreciated uh, as, as, as uh, being there. Uh, and, and, and the basis then of fruitful participation in the process of creation. So, um, um, I think, um, well, let, let me see if this, uh, again, this is Kuza, and he's, he's talking about a uh, nut tree and a, and a nut that turn, becomes the tree and so forth. Um, then in the dark, um, I must needs see past giving power to all seeds. I must needs pass beyond all generative power which can be known or imagined and enter into that ignorance wherein no vestige whatsoever remaineth of generative power or energy. Then, in the darkness, I find a power most stupendous, not to be approached by any power imaginable. And this is the principle which giveth being to all generative and other powers. This power, being absolute and exalted above all, giveth to every generative power that power within it enfolded uh, enfoldeth the virtual tree together with all things necessary to be an actual tree and that inhere in the being of the tree. Wherefore, this principle and cause containeth in itself as cause alike enfolded and absolutely un unenfolded. So I'll, I'll leave it there um, as a kind of opening for our discussions today. Uh, both presenters uh, present and then we will take questions after that and we are going to try to do as we discussed and keep our presentations to about 20 minutes so <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> thank you no, no problem we started later uh,
the conception of mankind and our ability to represent ourselves as a creative, unique power in the universe. And so uh, it's ironic because uh, today you have banks like Goldman Sachs and whatever who are, who are profiting off of quadrillions of dollars of worthless assets. But a few generations ago, uh, Paul Sachs, who was, the, I think, the grandfather of, the, of Jeffrey Sachs, uh, who currently runs Goldman Sachs, Jeffrey Sachs was a great patron of the museum community, and he made a proposal uh, for this very thing. He said that art is the imperishable and dynamic expression of these aims that we just discussed. It is, and always has been, the visible evidence of the activity of free minds. Uh, therefore, it should be resolved that American museums are prepared to do their utmost in the service of the people of this country during the present conflict, will keep their doors open uh, to help those who are seeking a refreshment of spirit. They will, with the sustained financial help of their communities, broaden their work. And I uh, would emphasize, they will be the sources of inspiration, illuminating the past and vivifying the present that they will fortify the spirit on which victory depends. It is, in fact, the cultural institutions that keep alive the, 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 this power, this ability of mankind to connect with all these other things at, at this time. George Stout, uh, the gentleman I referenced, who ran, he was the head of pretty much the whole operation, but was local, localized in northern and western Europe, he said that uh, to safeguard these things, these works of art, will not affect the course of battles, but it will affect the relations of invading armies with those peoples and their governments. To safeguard these things will show respect for the beliefs and customs of all men, and will bear witness that these things belong not only to a particular people, but also to the heritage of mankind. To safeguard these things is part of the responsibility that lies on the governments of the United Nations. These monuments are not merely pretty things, not merely valued signs of man's creative power. They are expressions of faith, and they stand for man's struggle to relate himself to his past and to his God. So, uh, these people, this generation, that president, General Eisenhower, who led Operation Overlord, the biggest military operation in the world, uh, they, they had this grasp. They understood these things. This was uh, the identity that they shared as part of the fabric of society, our, our common culture, despite all of our differences, that it was just understood that this is, this is just as important as the political and military, military defeat of evil was the uh, preservation of the good and its expressions. So uh, what people may not have known, or, and some people knew this, that not only was Hitler a uh, failed personality in the realm of statecraft and, and, uh, and the militaries and his views of, of people, he was also a failed artist. Yeah. And he was rejected from the Vienna Art Academy. And he took this uh, as a personal front, uh, as he did everything by Jews and whatever. Uh, and so one of the things that he did, which was actually central to his entire, um, everything he did, he had the intention in the city of Linz in Austria, his hometown, to create the Führer Museum. And the Leder Museum, or the Führer Museum, was where he planned to locate a uh, giant museum dedicated to himself and his excellence by pilfering and plundering the art of Europe for himself. And so as the Nazis invaded countries and took them over, they, they seized Jewish art because Jews are not allowed to own property. And it just so happened that most of the, the, arc, the, the priceless uh, works were owned by Rothschilds and other folks who were happened to be Jewish, right? So under his laws, uh, those were seized. And then, as we began to liberate Europe, 
they put out propaganda that we were going to just destroy the art because we were barbarians, and so they had to safeguard and remove the art in the same fashion to, to seize this stuff. And it was the job of the monuments uh, folks to find out what happened to this, in addition to preventing uh, churches and other things from being destroyed through the military advance. So, can you get the next slide, please? I'm going to touch upon a th three of these uh, just briefly. Uh, the sculpture on the left is the Madonna and Child by Michelangelo, which was lo which was stolen out of a uh, refectory in uh, Bruges, which is, I believe, in Belgium. And the Ghent altarpiece, which is also known as the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb by Jan van Eyck. Uh, which was stolen out of the Netherlands, and uh, Jan Vermeer's The Astronomer. All three of these represent a very you know, small percentage of the massive amounts of looting, but I touch upon the, he touches upon them in the books because of their unique significance. If you think about something you have at home or at your church, you know, a lot of churches, they might have a sculpture. It may not be the central aspect of the church. Or maybe you have uh, a special honorary plate on your mantelpiece or something like that that means something to you. The Brutes Madonna was a revolution in sculpture. Because in the past, uh, the, the representation of the Madonna and child generally followed a specific view, which was to say, the, and you saw this actually in in one of the paintings that Brian showed, Mother Mary is often shown very expressionless, looking down, and sort of disinterested or uninvolved. And the Jesus is often represented basically as sort of helpless, as a swaddling babe or not really alive, not really also human. And in the Brutes Madonna, what he did is he actually placed, and I know you can't see all of it, but he has Mary standing upright and looking out into the audience. And he has the child also standing up on his own and, and being effectively capable. And in the uh, ability to uh, see it in person, uh, or, or bigger pictures, which I don't have for you today, unfortunately, there's also emotion in the face of the baby Jesus, which is often not. Up until that time, when Michelangelo and other folks began to introduce an element of, of realism, the typical approach had been to create these things as stoic, as just unemotionally involved deities that just kind of were there. With blank eyeballs. Yeah, blank eyeballs and everything, right. <laughs> With the, the Ghent altarpiece, this was similarly a revolution in its time. And it was stolen which these, saw, these caused great outcry. Because what, as you saw with the other Van Eyck uh, painting that Brian put up, you have realism, you have perspective, you have depth, you have uh, use of artistic tools which draw your mind in. This, again, transformed the very way that people thought about their relationship to God, their relationship to their community. When it was unveiled, it had a similar effect on northwestern continent of Europe as the doors of Ghiberti did at the cathedral in Florence. Is that when people would come to church and they would look at this and they would study it and they would contemplate it and reflect on themselves, suddenly you had a, a, a flowering of a similar kind of artwork coming out of this area. The astronomer had a similar effect, where it was uh, it represented an allegorical portrayal of Dutch society, where science, you have an astronomer who's, again, you can't see all of it, but he's, he's, represent, he's studying a celestial globe in the back, you have books, you have uh, stereoscopic projections, you have allegory that connects art and science, history and religion into a realistic representation. 
this painting of the astronomer was Hitler's favorite painting. Mm. Huh. It disappeared in 1940, and it was discovered in a salt mine buried underneath the Swiss Alps. Mm. Wow. If you could get the next slide. Here are a few of the major repositories of plundered artwork. The Jeu de Pomme was a smaller museum than the Louvre in Paris. And then you also had the, if anyone has seen the Disney Castle in Disneyland, it's modeled off of Ludwig the Mads, uh, I can't pronounce that very well, Neuschwanstein Castle, which is in the mountains, the, the Alps of South Germany, as well as copper mines and salt mines located all over Germany, Czechoslovakia, northern Italy, and Austria. And two, three of the major repositories were in Ziegen, in Merkers, and in Altsy. Uh, one of the folks on the first slide, uh, Rose Vallon, who was working at the Jeu de Pomme, she was instrumental in cataloging and, uh, all the looting that was going on by the Nazis. That's why I had her face up there. Even though she wasn't officially part of the Monuments Men, she was part of the French Resistance as a spy. And it was her work that allowed the Monuments Men to discover the archives in the castle. What was her name again? Rose Vellon. E-A-L-L-A-N-D. And um, if you could get the next slide for me. Here's a couple of examples of some of the artwork. In the center there, you have wedding rings, a box of wedding rings. Wow. Uh, just rooms of statuettes plundered from churches, courtyards. Here's General Eisenhower looking at paintings that had just been stacked against the wall in the mine. No protections from, from the elements. Here's the Bruce Madonna being rescued. And then over here you have uh, another Flemish oh, artist. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, these are... Where was that found? Uh, also in Alta Sea. In a salt mine. Yeah. So, I mean, I have a, I have a representation of that, of that painting in my kitchen, where I cook my food, right, for people. <laughs> right. Yeah. You have these things. I mean, these, are, these are priceless treasures that were almost lost to, the, to humanity. And they were saved because of a very small handful of people who said, who, who organized folks like Eisenhower to, to issue a command as the head of the world military at that time, right? That uh, there's, if, you know, if there is a choice between our soldiers' lives and a building, clearly the building will need to be destroyed. But we cannot simply argue that military convenience is the same as military necessity. We have to protect these things for these reasons. Because this is the life, the, 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 the creative spring of future generations that so many of us today don't know about. If you can get the next slide. That the Nazis were trying to exterminate. Mm. These were stolen from our minds. They were stolen from our culture. And they were stolen wittingly in order to disrupt the, uh, the power that was built up in terms of a cultural power, a spiritual power, an economic power, a political power by the Allied forces, especially under the direction of, of Roosevelt and what he represented as a continuation of the American system set up by Alexander Hamilton and George Washington, to eliminate the ability for Nazis and their uh, war machines to come into power. And I don't have time to go through the, the large amount of information and documentation of those financial connections. But I can say very uh, briefly, and I'll go through this a little bit, uh, that the, the creation post in the post-war period, immediately, the first decade or so, of numerous institutions that we know of as the CIA, the NSA, the DIA, the other defense intelligence agency, 
you know, other institutions which are specifically organized around uh, what has been evolved into a, a shadow government, a government behind our government, which is using its surveillance powers, it's using its influence in terms of culture and the promotion, the funding of, of, of seemingly independent entities to undermine this ability. And, to, and, and, and it's doing it, the first way it did it was to attack our culture. And if you could get the next slide. Oh. So the Congress for Cultural Freedoms is a uh, nominally <coughs> anti-communist uh, grouping that was established through funding by the CIA to promote a view of, of mankind that specifically attacked the view that we've been discussing and we will continue to discuss and help make alive, more alive for you today. This was specifically done as an intervention to undermine all of these things that we've discussed. If you could, uh, and, and this guy here at the podium, Sidney Hook, was one of the chairs of this group. When, when uh, Lyndon LaRouche, in 1971, successfully debated a uh, leading Keynesian liberal economist to the point where the, the economist admitted, well, if the people of Germany had accepted uh, Schacht, the Yamar Schacht's policies, who was the finance minister of Hitler, then Hitler would not have been necessary. In other words, if they had accepted the economic oppression, then we would not have had to enforce it with jackboots and concentration camps. When LaRouche got that guy to admit it, Sidney Hook here at the chair, at the podium, he told LaRouche, you are now enemy number one to our establishment. And you will not be allowed to be, to be discussed. We're going to X you out. You've proven yourself effectively on the battlefield, so now it's war. And you understand and we understand what the real stakes are. That it's, it's, it's way above parties, it's way above left versus right, it's, it's mankind versus the oligarchy. We're, you got us, we're the oligarchy, you're representing mankind, so that's war. And it's been that war, this movement and our responsibilities and our roles has waged that war since that time through today. Can I get the next slide? So Brian went through this a little bit. I know text-based slides are really horrible, but I'm going to go through it. Subject, uh, what we're representing on the left is what's called the classical culture, where the nature of the culture is the, is the definition of the human mind, that the, human, the creative power of the human mind is central. It's central in economics. It's central in art. It's central in religion. It's central in history. It's central in physical science. It's the creative the act, the act of, of, of creating, it's creativity per se. The counterculture, which was created as a response to culture, as an attack upon culture, takes the opposite view. That the purpose of art, as they called it, is sensuous gratification or deprivation. That mankind is not immortally created inherently, as all of us each and every one of us, but that mankind is maybe a beast, or a machine, or maybe we don't even really exist, this is just some sort of ephemeral spiritual experience type thing. Reality ends at the point of your nose kind of view. There's all kinds of wrong ideas that are put out there. But the, the effect of, of this is found in the last point, where on the one hand, truth is considered to be knowable by the minds of an individual person. And on the other hand, truth is opinion, or mathematical formulas, or some other kind of thing other than that. And this took on, if you take the next slide, uh, a very insidious role in the promotion of, a, of, of mass culture, of mass psychology, which was promoted by people and, and, and uh, through Hollywood and through other forms. The long quote here on the side is from Bertrand Russell, who wrote a book uh, called The Impact of Science on Society, where he says it, the, the, 
mass psychology is the, is the next most important thing for governments to take on. That we have to be able to use education and other institutions to produce the conviction that snow is black in our children. And not necessarily literally like believing snow is black, but believing that truth is what we teach you it is. Truth is not something that you discover through a, a rigorous process of investigating uh, opposites and arriving at a higher, deeper uh, idea. Truth is passing the test. So, uh, and then he points out that verses set to music are very effective at conditioning people in this fashion. If you could get the next slide. And this is the result. The result of 65, 75 years of enforced whitewashing of, our, of the heritage of Western civilization has resulted in a massive increase, especially since September 11th, of heroin-related overdoses, of suicides, of a financial empire which is based on completely fictitious assets with no investment in an actual physical standard of living. And so when the development of modern music was, was promoted by people like Adorno through the CCF and, and his schools, the Frankfurt School, what he sees is modern, this is his quote, that modern music sees absolute oblivion as its goal. It is the surviving message of despair from the shipwrecked. And if you look at our society today, you look at what we're, what we're seeing, when you have people overdosing in grocery stores and their two-year-olds are trying to wake them up. You have, you have a, I mean, that's a video going around the internet right now. It's horrifying. That is why what we're doing in this movement is so, so important. Because this movement is seeking to reintroduce us all, as many as we can reach, to this level of fight and to the actual breakthroughs that were made in epistemology, in statecraft, in economics, and in culture and art and spirituality. So if you could get the uh, last slide for me here. Uh, and I want to counterpose this uh, picture here on the screen to the one on the piano. The piano is the Duomo of the Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, which, when was built by Brunelleschi, and was an inaugural of the Renaissance in Florence. The picture on the screen is the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, which is one of the three greatest mosques in the area of Southwest Asia. And in the inside the mosque is a tomb dedicated to St. John the Baptist. As Senator Richard Black from Virginia has made very clear in his trips over to Syria to debunk the uh, administration's war propaganda, the religious interrelationship between Muslims and Christians in Syria is it's, it's as part of their social fabric as, as what I've been going through here. They do not see themselves in the way that is portrayed where Christians and Muslims have to be at war with each other because of Sharia or millenarian end times, Jesus coming again. And I like this because you see the way this stands above the world, uh, the village uh, of, of Damascus, in the same way as the dome does in Florence. Now, if if we fail as a as a movement, this will be destroyed by ISIS. ISIS has destroyed quite a bit of other immortal things. Uh, whether or not you uh, believe in the stories of the Bible as literally true, this is the land of which they're from. There's about six tombs of Daniel spread throughout from like Turkey through Southwest Asia. Uh, one of these was destroyed by ISIS in Iraq. So this is Daniel in the lion's den, right? The power of the story, physically destroyed. Jonah was in the belly of the whale. His tomb, destroyed by ISIS. Oh my God. I didn't even know it existed. 
until I started looking up these things. This is what we're losing. And by, by, by having our administration support uh, weapons and, and money to terrorists, that's what we're helping destroy. So we have to uh, take, this is not a historical lecture, but it's something which is absolutely relevant to our, our efforts today and the significance of the JASTA legislation and other things being passed uh, bears directly upon saving this legacy forever. Because everyone should have a chance to see these things and know these things and enjoy these things. So that's my presentation for you today. Thank you.
yeah, well, so the British and the Americans took very different approaches to uh, to this, where the, the especially in Italy, where uh, the British said, you know, we're more interested in military victory. We're not so concerned with the effects of our bombing, and that took extreme expression in Dresden, where they specifically uh, organized the bombing in such a way using certain related incendiaries to effectively turn the whole town into a chimney, which then burned it to a crisp. And, uh, they were doing a similar thing in places like Florence, where they wanted to uh, bomb uh, during the nighttime because they thought, well, it'd be safer for our pilots, but the rail depot just happened to be next to an abbey. And so we, we're not super concerned, well, we'll try to bomb the rail depot, but if we destroy this Two, you know, this thousand-year-old abbey at the same time, well, you know, tough luck, but... Cheerio. But, yeah, cheerio, right. Bomb away. And the Americans said, no, even though it's more dangerous, we're going to bomb during the daytime because we can be precise. We can hit the military target and not across the street hit the, the cultural one. Now, as far as the other thing goes, I mean, they, th there is other discussion about this, and we've published works on this you can read. Uh, the idea of, of attacking truth took a form of, of labeling things. So if you, because Hitler was an authoritarian, he said, I have the truth, and if you don't believe my truth, I'll kill you. <laughs> this was translated into anyone who says this is true is a Hitler. And that's obviously a logical fallacy, but that was, that was popularized. And ironically enough, I mean, Hannah Arendt was being Jewish, uh, had a relationship, I don't know if it was official or not, uh, publicly recognized with Martin Heidegger, right, the Nazi philosopher. So, you know, just goes to show you that just because you're Jewish doesn't mean you can't also be a Nazi. Just because you're a uh, Christian doesn't mean that you're above, you know, contempt or something like that. It, it's, are you a good person? Do you, do you have, is, is the God that you say you worship the God of truth? And it, is that truth obscured or is it knowable? And one thing Kuza really did a good job with was showing that though that, that God is not beyond rational comprehension, uh, even if it is imperfect. And yeah, I have something on that too. Well, I was wondering, are there were there any of these artists who wrote up anything on these various perspectives, or do you just have to figure it out by studying the painting? Well, <clears throat> um, a number of them are lost, um, uh, but uh, but Luca Pacioli's uh, the last of his four books is is really Piero from Piero della Francesca's uh, work, and uh, so that survives. Um, and uh, uh, linear perspective survives through the the book of um, of um, uh, Alberti. Um, uh, so it's all common known as uh, Albertian perspective, linear perspective. Uh, he dedicates the, the book to Brunelleschi, um, but to he himself, it, his his book is really a draftsman's book. It's an, it, 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 he's not discussing the, the profounder intention. Um, just just to say that in passing. Um, and uh, Leonardo da Vinci's, uh, we have uh, fragments of his writings of his manuscripts. Um, which which are, are profound, um, uh, but uh, but we you know it is actual works we don't survive. So you know it's but it's there, it's there. I think the next presentation on, on the defense of poetry will will expand on you know what I was opening up in terms of my presentation in terms of, of humanist culture in a, in a broader and deeper way. So uh, it's not a matter of simply deciphering. Paintings, uh, it's it's the, the method is more generally available, or, or uh, to, to any thinking human being. Okay. Okay. You were talking about oh, just a quick question. You were talking about the uh, the paintings, you know, the people that were going to church and they would study the paintings and reflect on them, and mm -hmm. they became a better society, and that's how we have the Renaissance. Okay, like were there like. Diaries or notes, like you know, in modern times, we you know, like from reading diaries of the Civil War, what 
people actually thought of do we, do we have like what people thought when they were looking at these paintings or do we just know it from the fact that society got better well yeah first of all i mean i know you're simplifying to compress the question so i, I i'm not but I, I just want to be clear that uh, the, the the method is the method of Cousin. Uh, the paintings are just simply uh, a, a, a one were one vehicle uh, and it's not just paintings, of course, a lot of them were stucco. Uh, you know, they were painted into the walls, as is The Last Supper, for example. Um, uh, in fact, uh, oil painting was something that developed in northern Europe in Flanders. It was not even available uh, in the early Renaissance period. And it was brought down from Flanders. And so the oil paintings, but not just the oil painting, painting but the use of reflection that you see in Spumato and, and Da Vinci and so forth. This this develops out of out of uh, out of uh, what had been undertaken in, in Northern Europe. So you have this great interchange of ideas going on, and part of that interchange, of course, was also this question of of unleashing this capacity of man um, in society, uh, which is not simply the building of cities and building of industry. You have. Um, Leonardo da Vinci's works on engineering, on uh, building textile mills powered by water and so forth. I mean, just an incredible outpouring of ideas and conceptions to, to increase man's power over nature. But this was also the launching of the projects to the New World, which we didn't even know existed. But the, to, to, to take man beyond uh, the uh, visible horizon, right, in more ways than one. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, Toscanelli, you know, as I mentioned, uh, so there is, this is, uh, their painting was one avenue, one vehicle, sculpture, but it, it's as, it turns out more specifically than what you had was you had, in the day you had letters, of course, written, uh, uh, but letters then were understood to be public uh, manuscripts, if you will. In other words, if, uh, if you received a letter from Toscanelli or from Cusa or whoever, it was expected, unless it was a very private letter and that took a different form, it was understood that that letter would be copied and would be circulated by the receiver to others. And then this would become the basis for discussion and collaboration. Um, and of course, responses back and so on and so forth. So you had a broad discussion. Many of these, not many of them don't, but many of them do survive. And so we know about these uh, about the collaboration of Toscanelli, you know, with Columbus and, and Coos and so on and so on. We, we know about this through some of these surviving actual physical letters. Maybe we don't have the letter going one way, we don't have the letter back, but we know that these uh, discussions, you know, were, were part of the rich tapestry. So like an email today. Yeah, like an email today. <laughs> 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 you know, we didn't have Snapchat, so some of them survived. Joe, do you have oh, something? Yeah, before, before ISIS and the front side, you have a, after the Baghdad Museum was looted, <clears> and <throat> Rumsfeld said, stuff happens. Well, not only that. I mean, uh, we haven't had a we haven't had the in intention to protect uh, culture since World War II, really since Truman dropped the bombs. Uh, what about Vietnam? What about Laos? What about Cambodia? What about all these places? I mean, there's ancient temples of you know of Buddhist culture in the forests of some of these jungles, right? What happened to them when we just dumped Agent Orange all over this stuff? I mean, they're, they're, the idea of, uh, and that leads to things like um, Marines, you know, doing some of the things that they've been caught doing, you know, urinating on people and stuff, you know. So, I mean, we're not, we're not even educating our, with the, the military revolution, the things that Rumsfeld introduced, you know, with the, with the, uh, the game strategies and so the video game tactics of winning a war. Uh, we're not even educating our soldiers. And that was something the Monuments Men understood very clearly, is that a cultured soldier is a better soldier. Not just uh, in relation to protecting heritage, but on the, the battlefield. Because they can think, they can reason. We got time for one more? Yeah, yeah you, uh, when you just mentioned Vietnam, that made me think of 
uh, reports of what Paul Pot and the Khmer Rouge did in uh, trying to get rid of all the intellectuals. If you wore glasses, you were subject to yeah. being executed or put in a work camp or whatever. Same thing with the Cultural Revolution in China. China. You know, then of course what Hitler was doing. So obviously, any leader who hates the idea of man in the image of God and, and the, the founding principles of this nation will try and wipe out thinking individuals and the culture that they produce. And it's only, I guess you would say, it, it's, it's even more evil the techniques of Bertrand Russell and the uh, CCF because they try and do it through mass brainwashing rather than just naked power. Right, so it's it's something that goes on throughout history in different cultures. It's not just something that, that happened, you know, in, in Germany because Hitler was, you know, a mad genius or something. That's been overcome through man's uh, man's creative mm -hmm. capacities. So I think the poetry discussion will 